Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, as we continue in this series of when a church puts the Savior on display. When a church puts the Savior on display. Revelation chapter 2 is where we'll draw our text from here this morning, but prior to us uh, getting there, I want to go back to chapter 1 and realize here in verse 11, the whole reason uh, or the audience, if you will, of this particular uh, book that was written by the Apostle John under the direction, the guidance of the Holy Spirit was specifically written uh, to uh, unto the seven churches uh, which are in Asia. And those seven churches are listed there in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 1. It says Ephesus. We looked at that church last week. And then unto Smyrna, which is the church we'll look at this week, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto uh, Laodicea. And it's uh, uh, very clear from the description that uh, John receives uh, from uh, uh, the Spirit of God and in uh, what he wrote here that the churches are likened to a candlestick, a candlestick. And, and there's mentioned uh, also the, uh, the seven angels or the messengers, the implication of that Greek word there being the pastors of those churches. Uh, but the specific uh, uh, illustration that we're given to represent the church is there are those candlesticks. And when you think about a candlestick, again, I pointed to these candlesticks over here last week, and, and we realize those candlesticks are the part that holds or supports the candle. And, and I believe this, the, the spiritual emphasis is certainly we see throughout the, uh, the New Testament is that we are to support or display the light of Jesus Christ to a dark world. And that is the, the commission that we've been given as a church, and that is certainly uh, the, the main reason, if you will, that we're here. And so we're trying to draw some parallels from the instructions given, or the descriptions given to these churches that will help us to be a church that puts the Savior on display. And every one of us uh, here this morning, uh, we ought to take serious uh, thought to that concept, knowing that the way that we live our life, the way that we interact with the world around us is, is, is part of us displaying the Savior uh, before others. And, and that is a very uh, a real responsibility that we must uh, uh, give some serious uh, thought uh, to. Now this particular church of Smyrna, again we looked at the church of Ephesus last week and that would have been uh, really that church that was started first out of these seven churches uh, there in that a area of uh, Asia. Paul, having spent about three years in that area uh, or in that city of Ephesus and that church was uh, formed and, and started. And, and then a, as you look a little bit further from that uh, process, it, it says over in the book of Acts chapter 19 that while the Paul was there, he went in the synagogue, he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And then it says there in, in verse 9, But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years. And then it says this statement there, So that all which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And because of that, that time of teaching, because of that time of evangelism in the beginning of that church, and then that church catching that vision to really be a church that starts other churches and to uh, spread out into that region, we see there were several other churches that were started as the result of that evangelistic uh, effort. In this church, Smyrna, 
Smyrna uh, or this church in Smyrna would have been one of those churches. And this city was about 35 miles north uh, of Ephesus, again, along one of that, that, that main trade route that would have been well-traveled uh, as people, uh, things and, and goods came and, and were offloaded uh, off the ships and then that they were spread throughout that country, throughout that region of Asia. It, it is said that maybe by the time uh, that Paul actually uh, was there in that region on that third missionary journey, there's probably a, a good uh, 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 problem Process that might have been at least a hundred thousand people in uh, that region, in that city. I'm sorry of. Uh, Smyrna. Uh, this was a, an area that certainly was a center uh, for a learning of science and the learning of medicine. Uh, this was an area that the, imp, uh, that the temple of the god of wine and, uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, built in this particular city. So you can imagine what went on with that, right? Uh, all the wine and the drunkenness and all the things of that sort. And, and we've seen from our study in the book of Acts that the time frame uh, that these uh, believers were witnessing during this time frame when the Apostle Paul was traveling through this region, uh, it was not a, uh, an area of just you know, a, a pleasant Christian people. Uh, there was a lot of idolatry and a lot of wickedness and a lot of philosophy and a lot of, uh, uh, of leaning to man's own thinking, kind of like the, uh, the time that is descriptive of the judges, the book of the judges, when everyone did that which was right in uh, their own eyes. And we're going to see from this church here uh, this morning uh, the difficulty that that kind of lifestyle uh, brought about in that beginnings uh, or in uh, that church. And we remember from the, from the uh, church of Ephesus some of the lessons that we drew, uh, excuse me, that helps us to be a church that displays the Savior. Uh, there will be a persistent and patient physical exertion. Uh, the church of Ephesus was a church that really put their hand to the plow and they did work. It was a, a church that taught us that there will be a passion to remain true to pure Doctrine, and let's never forget that. They, they hated uh, <clears throat> the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They hated the teachings and the philosophies that came along uh, with that. And Jesus uh, essentially commended him for that and said, you're hating what I hate. And that's always a good uh, side to be on. When the Lord hates it, we ought to hate it. All right. When the Lord loves it, we, we must uh, love it. And then we also saw that there would be a commitment to Christ based upon a love connection uh, the one issue that Christ had with the church of Ephesus, and I say one, not belittling it, but one as the one that he mentioned, was that they had lost their first love. And uh, because they had lost their first love, uh, the Lord said he's actually going to remove the candlestick out of there. And uh, they would no longer be a church that would display the Savior. And we saw uh, the, the, the uh, recipe for getting that love back and making sure that what we do uh, as believers, what we do as church members, what we do as a church is based upon uh, a love for uh, our Savior. But I want you to notice some more things here this morning in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to start here with verse 8. The Bible says these words, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, you may notice and pick up fairly quickly on this uh, idea here as we go through these seven churches and, and, and take apart the message to each one of them and how it applies to us. This one church, this church of, uh, at Smyrna, was the one church that the Lord didn't say anything negative about. 
And uh, man, I kind of like that, right? I don't know how you are in studying the Word of God, but you know you get to a lot of the stories of the Word of God and, and a lot of the individuals that are represented in the Word of God. And really, we can kind of take comfort in this. But you know, almost every one of them had some kind of, uh, of chapter in their life that they wish they could have erased. So almost every one of them have a time that they faced a a difficulty, a struggle in which we would term, and and I know that God doesn't necessarily put degrees on sin, but we would term as a major sin in their life. I mean, uh, if you really think of it, and I've looked at it from this perspective before, and maybe this is not the best perspective, but I said, you know, the reality is I would have had a very difficult time pastoring most of the men in the Bible. I mean, let's start, just think about Noah. What happened to Noah? He got drunk, didn't he? And some things happened when he got drunk. And we're thinking, oh man, can you imagine approaching old Noah and saying, now Noah, I know you preached for a long time. I know that you built an ark and I know that, you know, by faith you really, you saved all of mankind, uh, the race of mankind by being able to start here. But really? We need to talk about this whole drunkenness thing. I mean, then it just goes on. I mean, Abraham, he had his moments, right? When he lied and said that his wife was his sister and in order to get out of them potentially killing him. for I mean, what kind of man is that? And, and David, who committed murder and adultery. And uh, Samson, who, I mean, we just can go down the list. Now, now, now that, we, 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 we understand that and we can relate to that. But then we get to individuals like Joseph, Right? And I know there's probably a few items in Joseph's life where we could get a little, you know, questioning him about. Maybe he had a little bit of pride uh, there at the early age or a lack of discretion at the least or something that thing. But you know, Joseph stayed true uh, to the Lord. Daniel, Daniel was one that stayed true uh, when he went into Babylon and yet he remained and he ended up in the lion's den and still under service of so many of those wicked kings, he remained true to the Lord. This church in Smyrna is kind of one of those stories where there's not the negative to, to, to hold on to or to look at. And so let's, let's take this apart a little bit and again remember Remembering that God wants us to be a church that puts the Savior on display. Amen? Amen. He wants us to shine out that light of Jesus Christ. And in order to be that kind of church, in order to be that kind of candlestick, we need to notice a few things here. First of all, it's a persuaded church. A persuaded church. Here's the statement I want you to hold on to. I know... He knows. Say that with me. I know He knows. One more time. I know He knows. Now, do you really know that He knows? I know He knows. Take a look here in verse, uh, uh, what is it, verse uh, 9, I think it is. He says this, uh, and this is Jesus talking. I know thy works. I know thy works. And tribulation, and poverty, and I know the blaspheme of them, and and he goes on to describe that. Right there he tells them that he knows. He knows. When you think about it in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 12, the Bible says, For the which cause I also uh, suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Now Paul in his instruction to Timothy made it very clear. Uh, Timothy, I know. (laughs) I am persuaded. I I realize that there's there's some people that may contemplate these things, whether or not they're real. There's some people that may question whether or not these things are real or not. But today, I know He knows. I am persuaded of that fact. I believe it. And I realize that He can keep it. He can can keep it unto Him, uh, or what I've committed unto Him against 
that day. In Philippians chapter 1, in verse 6, it says it this way, being confident, confident. Do you like to be confident today? Oh, man, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like that whole driving thing, right? Somebody was telling me a little story about their driving episode and how it wasn't, it, was, it didn't go very well. And now the reality is they're not very confident to get behind the wheel anymore. But you know, when you get behind that wheel and you're going you're gonna to drive, there needs to be a certain level of confidence that you know how to handle that vehicle. That you know how to stay between the lines. Amen? That you know which one's the brake and which one's the gas pedal. And that you don't get those things mixed up. That you know reverse and you know drive and you know what uh, uh, I had to I had to get a physical this uh, uh, two whatever week or two ago or something like that and, um, and and the woman felt really stupid but she said I'm sorry I have to do this and she gives gives me this little bag of blocks of um, colored blocks and she says okay now which one is red. Which one is blue? Which one is green? Which one is yellow? And I, I thought about being stupid, and, but I, I couldn't because I had to pass the test, all right? So, and, and, then it, and then she said, well, this is the reason. Because when you get to a stoplight, you need to know what color it is. Or, and I said, well, you can do it by the position of the light, right? Uh, I said, well, yeah, but then you get to a flashing light, and you need to know, is it flashing red or is it flashing yellow? Because flashing yellow, you can kind of proceed through. Flashing red, you better stop. I said, well, if it's flashing, we'll just stop. How about that, you know? Uh, no, you, you, get, you kind of have to uh, uh, realize uh, these things. But there's a, there's a confidence today that is not in the, my ability to drive, all right? There's a confidence today in what the Lord knows about me. Uh, the, the, the idea here, he said, uh, he's called this very, very thing that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a, a wonderful promise? And, and really, there's a, there's a peace to that, knowing the Lord saved us, amen, and the Lord can keep us, amen. And the Lord can help us to be able to continue until there's no more reason to continue. There's a confidence level here that says, though I don't know that I can really handle this idea of being a candlestick, the reality is that's what God's made me, that's what God's placed me, that's what God desires of me, and God can perform it. A church that displays the Savior is persuaded that, I, that the Lord knows. The Lord knows. Now here's a couple of things I want you to think about. First of all, I'm persuaded that the Lord is aware of what I do and go through. Let me read that again. I am persuaded that the Lord is aware of what I do and go through. Now, there's a big difference between being persuaded of something and thinking something. You know, in your conversation, if you think that is a certain thing or certain way, you approach your conversation that way, don't you? Well, don't hold me to my word, but I think this is what it is. Now, if you're persuaded of something, it's a little different though, isn't it? It's a absolute, I don't have to... I don't have to give you any doubt. I don't have to cast any doubt. I don't have to have any out on this one. I am persuaded that salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. I am persuaded of that. I don't have to question it. I don't have to, to guess about it. I don't have to apologize for it. I am persuaded. Now, if you are thinking that God is aware of what you do, and you're thinking that God is aware of what you're going through, there's a difference than you knowing, than you being persuaded of that very thing. And how is that in my life? Well, if I think that God's aware of it, then I'm still going to question about going through it. If I think that God knows about it, then I'm still going to uh, maybe worry a little bit whether or not He can take care of me through it. But if I'm persuaded about it today, 
then I am confident that God is very aware of my day. He's very aware of my feelings. He's very aware of everything that is going on with me, how anyone else is treating me. I am persuaded of that. And that's how I can be a church that displays the Savior. Number two, though, I'm persuaded that the Lord does not base my worth on my material possessions. Did you notice what he says about this church? He says right here, he says, I know thy works and tribulation, so I understand what you're doing, I understand what you're going through. But then he says, and your poverty. And I believe that every word is, is very important in the Bible, even in, when it's in parenthesis. And what does it say right there in parenthesis? But thou art what? Rich. Hmm. What was wrong with this church? And, and this was certainly the case, uh, predominantly the case uh, there in that region among those believers because there was so, uh, so much wickedness and, and um, so much of man's religion permeated the entire culture. That when it came down to you proclaiming Christ and living a real Christian life, there was a lot of persecution, and we'll see that here in just a minute. But that persecution many times resulted in poverty. Why? Well, because they would come in and take your stuff away. They would blackball you so that you couldn't get a job. They would cut you out of the the commerce and the deals and you weren't one of the good old boys and that really started to hurt the bank account but aren't you glad today listen that the Lord doesn't look at my bank account and say ah, I guess you're okay He doesn't look at my house. He doesn't look at my vehicles. He doesn't look at the things that I have. He does not look at what my net worth is. Like the government wants to know. But he's got a complete different standard that says whether you're rich or whether you're poor. And folks, today I need to be persuaded of this, that it's his standard that really matters. It's his standard that I really want to abide by and live up to. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and get this, and yet possessing all things. You know what I, I kind of concluded as simply is this, is a church that is, worried about materialism is not a church that's going to put the Savior on display. But a church that is persuaded about what God values will be a church that puts the Savior on display. Number three, though, I'm a persuaded church. I am persuaded that the Lord perceives the true nature of others. I am persuaded that the Lord perceives the true nature of others. Look at the last part of that verse there. And I know, all right, I know He knows, amen? I know He knows, I'm persuaded. I know the blaspheme of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of who? Really? Guess what? You can pretend to be religious, but God really knows. They can tend, pretend to be religious, but God really knows. And, and, and I, I struggle with this one because in the world that we live in today and even in the, the community that we're reaching out to and that we're displaying uh, the Savior before, we realize that there is a lot of false teaching and a lot of false concepts and a lot of people that think they're okay with God based on a, a, a human thinking or a human teaching that is contrary to the Word of God. And sometimes you almost get into a brick wall situation where there's, there's not going to be 
any give or take here because they're confident that they're right and you're confident that the Bible is right. And no matter what you say or no matter what you do, they're going to continue uh, to feel or to follow that which they've been taught even though it's not the Word of God. And, and here's the reality is this, is anybody can claim anything but God truly knows the heart. And God truly knows what the truth is and what the truth is not. When John, Jesus was walking this earth and dealing with the religious group, he told them these words. He said in John 8, 44, Ye are your father, the devil. Now, I don't think I could get away with saying that. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. It's kind of like knocking on the door, right? Hello, how are you? I'm Pastor Jonathan. I'm for Victory Baptist Church. Do you, do you go to church anywhere in the area? Yes, I go down to such and such church and I'm not going to name it. Really? Yeah, we've been going there for, for all these many years and doing this for all this and, and, and we're good. Okay. Well, what do you believe in regards to getting to heaven? Are you going to make it there? Well, I sure hope so. Okay. Anytime somebody says hope so, that should be a red flag, by the way, okay? Because let me tell you something, I know so. Amen? Amen. I know so. And not because I know everything, because the Word of God says I can know. <laughs> and that's how I know. And then you go on and you say, it's, okay, well, you know, if you're going you're gonna to get to the gate of heaven and the Lord's going to say, why should I let you in? What are you going to tell him exactly? Well, you know, I don't know that I really know the answer to that question, but, but, but I think that, you know, I, I, I guess I would just tell him as long as, uh, uh, or I, 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 you know, I, I, I've done a lot of good things in this life. And I think God is going to let me in. I think we'll be all right. I think him and I will have a, just a good conversation and I'll show him the things that I've done and, and he knows my heart and he knows how much church I've gone to and he knows how much I've given and, and he knows how much I've read the Bible and I think that I'm okay with God. And when you start to say, okay, well, can I give you a little insight that I found in the Bible in regards to that statement? And you start to talk about sin and how good works don't get us there. And all of a sudden it's like, no, you know what, I'm good. Somebody else needs that message. Folks, today is the reality is this. I'm persuaded the Lord perceives the true nature of others. And we're in a day where we're faced a lot of pressure to cave to the commonality of religion. Let's all just be one. Let's all just get along. Let's all just agree. And we'll just get there any way we can. But what are we going to do? We're going to have to keep displaying the light of Jesus Christ. And that is the truth. I'm persuaded though that the Lord perceives the true nature of others. It wasn't only just a persuaded the church, but it was number two, a persecuted church. A persecuted church. I know he cares. Can you say that with me? I know he cares. One more time. I know he cares. Now, do you know he cares? Yes, amen. I know he cares. Cares. I want you to look at verse 10 here because this is an interesting concept that, that uh, uh, certainly kind of goes against the idea of Christ caring. Because here I'm talking about a persecuted church, and I believe this with all my heart, a persecuted church is a church that displays the Savior. It's a church that puts Jesus Christ above everything else. Here's what he says in verse 10, Fear none of those things uh, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall come or cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. 
When he was back in verse 9, he knew their works, but he also knew their tribulation. And it's very clear from the, from the, uh, uh, the different verses that he gives to this church that they were being persecuted for their belief in Jesus Christ. And that fits a lot of other places in Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, the Bible says in verse 3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. Now you realize what a point it is, right? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the concept is this. You've been saved today, and the reality is if you're going to live for Jesus Christ, you've been appointed to suffer in living for Jesus Christ. He also says it in this. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Now our tribulation that we face today is nothing compared to the tribulation that they were facing during this specific age. And we've also seen from history that there's been a, an ebb and flow in persecution. There's been times when people were imprisoned and people were uh, uh, killed, people were burned, people were slaughtered because they stood for the name of Jesus Christ. And, and we have a, a, a difficult time really relating to that because of the Christianity and the freedom that we have experienced uh, from that. But let me tell you something, it is getting a little more difficult to to really proclaim the name of Christ and not catch a lot of flack for it, not have uh, people upset uh, 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 against you, not to have people stand against you. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 10, it says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, and then he goes on to this, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. And if Paul had some other uh, years after this writing, he would have had a whole lot more places to add to that, right? What persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Now look at Paul's situation, and sometimes I'm not sure that I agree with him that the Lord delivered him. But I guess by the fact he was still walking and he was still talking, I guess that's how he looked at it and said, the Lord delivered him. I'm thinking deliverance is I didn't get the stripes. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Think about these things here. We must never be afraid of suffering while displaying the Savior. What did he say there? Fear none of these things. Now I know I'm not really emphasizing just a mediocre church. I'm not emphasizing status quo here today. I'm emphasizing a church that wants to display the Savior. And in order to be that kind of church, we can't be afraid of the persecution, of the suffering, the difficulties that might come when we uphold the truth among others. It's very ironic, right? Almost divine appointment that Brother Penny and his family are here this morning. He shared with us in the first service how Samoa is 99.9% .9 Christian, right? But when you get truly saved, born again the Bible way, and began to preach and promote that among your family, all of a sudden you're ousted. And they no longer want to have anything to do with you. Doesn't quite make sense, does it? Well, obviously the conclusion is the 99.9% .9 Christian must not be talking about true Christianity. It's a form of religion and churches everywhere and people filling the churches on Sundays. But when somebody actually says, this is what the Lord says, this is what the Bible says, and they're put out, it's a form of persecution. We, can't, we just shouldn't be afraid of that. 
I mean, there's a lot of things that we fear in this life and a lot of situations that we might find ourselves that, that we think is, is very uh, a fretful situation to be in and, and I don't know what I would do and I don't know how I would handle it and I don't know what would, what would come about because of it. But the reality is this, is Christ gave, gave this instruction to the church of Smyrna that was experiencing these persecutions and He said, don't be afraid. Do not draw back now now let me just put it in terms of right now some of us are too afraid to walk up to somebody and try to share Christ with them uh oh he quit preaching and started meddling now I could never do that pastor I could never talk to a stranger I, I could never mention the Bible to anyone. Do you know what would happen if I did that? What? I would faint. I wouldn't know what to say. I just can't do it. Why can't we do it? Because of fear. You say, Pastor, how do you know me so well? Because I know me. I've been there. In fact, it seems like every time I go on outreach, I'm there. But I can't be afraid. You can't be afraid. We have the greatest message ever known to mankind. What are we worried about? That they may not want it? That they may not like it? that they may not like you because you're sharing it. Don't be afraid. Do not draw back in our witnessing or in our display of the Savior. Here's another one though. Difficulties will be used to purify our lives. Difficulties will be used to purify our lives. You see what he says there? He said, um, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That what? Ye may be tried tried now that 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 word tried there is that also that same word that we get uh, uh, from the concept of refining fire or being purified when the heat is turned up and because of the heat the dross raises to the top the impurities in that precious metal come to the top and you're able to scrape it off and in the process of scraping it off now that metal becomes more purified and it's of more value, and it's of more use. And, and when we think about in our lives, we have the impurities that are there because of the flesh. We have the impurities that are there because of false thinking. We have the impurities that are there because of our upbringing and of whatever sorts it comes from, the source it comes from. The reality is this, is the Lord sometimes needs to turn the heat up on us in order to get some of those things out so that we can be that much more equipped to be able uh, to display the Savior. And so when we think about this kind of church, we realize the difficulties will be used to purify our, our lives. And so the concept would be this then, to embrace it. To embrace it. If the Lord says it's for our trying, if the Lord says it's for our benefit, then just go ahead and accept it and embrace it. But here's another one. Our persecutions will cease. Amen. What does he say there? He says, and the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation, how long? Ten days. Now, can I tell you this? If the Lord says ten days, you know what that means? Ten days, all right? We don't have to, we don't spiritualize this. We don't have to explain this away or whatever. If the Lord says this is how long it'll be, this is how long it'll be. And when we get into this persecution thing, sometimes we seem like it'll never stop. It'll never last. I mean, it'll never cease. And yet in the reality is this, there will be a ceasing of that persecution. And so the encouragement today is to endure it, to endure it. And then number four, that Last idea behind a persecuted church is this. Persecution reminds us of the cost of service. Persecution reminds us of the cost of service. Therefore, I am to surrender to it. 
Think about what he says here in verse 10, the latter part. He says, be thou faithful unto what? <coughs> What's the worst that anybody could do to you? Kill us? I mean, I know there's the idea of sometimes you'd rather be dead than suffer, but the worst that could happen is I die. Is that really the worst? Brother Gary assures me that's the best. <laughs> Thank you for putting me out of my misery and into glory. <laughs> now think about it here. Be faithful unto death. You know, here, here's a concept. You really want to get fervent about something? then realize it's so valuable that you would die for it. It is of such importance that you would give everything in order to promote it, in order to share it, in order to display it. And I believe the teachings of Christ are very fitting in that realm. He talks a lot about counting the cost, laying down our lives, taking up our cross, and following Him. That's a church that displays the Savior. Number three, the last idea here is a protected church. A protected church. I know He can. Say that. I know He can. Do you? Do you know today that He knows? I, I mean, that's just, wow! To know that God knows. Do you know that He cares? Amen? That He loves me. That He died for me and that I can die for Him. And do you know today that He can. He can. Look at, look at verse 11 here. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith in the churches. Do you have ears this morning? Amen? Are you listening? Are they turned on? Are they open? You got an ear to hear? Listen. Listen. Here's what he says. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now that second death in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14, it's mentioned, it says this, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I know that again is not a very popular teaching of our day. It's not, very, it's not something that's mentioned very often, but the reality is hell is a real place. And those that are lost without Jesus Christ, one day the Bible says that all hell and death will be cast into the lake of fire and into that lake of fire which burneth forever and ever and ever. This is the second death. This is the final resting place for eternal punishment of those that have, have denied the Savior. Those have looked and said, I do not want salvation. I am not willing to uh, uh, repent and trust in Jesus Christ. They will die in their sin and they will be required to pay for their own sin in a horrible place but a church that is born again the Bible way has a lot to rejoice in because we are a protected church and that second death has no power over us instead what do we get to experience eternal life in heaven, eternal life in heaven. Here's some things I know He can. We are dependent upon His power. His power. He's the one. He's the one that will help us to be able to make it through the persecutions, to make it through the trials. He's the one that empowers us to do the works. He's the one that provides for us in our, 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 our poverty. So we're dependent upon His provision. His provision. 
That's why I love just going to the Lord, especially before the kids, and just really rejoicing in the fact that God has provided us with another meal to eat. God has provided us with a bed to sleep in and a roof over our heads. God has provided for us a means to get to church, but God has provided for us an opportunity to preach the Savior to a lost and dying world. And then the last one is we are dependent upon His promise. We are dependent upon His promise. I know that He can. And the reason I know that He can is because He told me He would and I believe His word. I believe His promises because I am dependent upon that promise. And if He said, I will give thee a crown of life, then guess what? I'm looking forward to that crown of life. (laughs) I'm looking forward to that precious promise that the Savior uh, promised to give me. I want you to just draw your attention back to verse 8. Verse 8, and I'll finish with this this morning. You know, in all of these uh, 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 letters... And all of these uh, descriptions and these principles and, and, uh, and the things that John wrote to these churches, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals Himself in a unique way to each one of them. Now a persecuted church, right? They were persuaded of some things and they were a protected church, no doubt. But you know, here's the amazing thing. Here's how Jesus reveals himself to them. He says unto the angel church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last. The first and the last. If anybody ever tries to tell you that Jesus is not God, spit in their eye. Okay, maybe not spit in their eye. But give them the principle of the Bible. Jesus said, I am the what? First and the last. I am the first and the last. In my mind, that equates to God. God. Revelation chapter 1. In verse 8, it said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Today, you know what? I can display a Savior who began it all and will complete it all. (laughs) what a message we have what a reason to live our life that we have the first and the last but he also said this he said which was dead and is alive which was dead and is alive now he said in verse 11 of chapter 1 he said saying I'm Alpha and Omega the first and the last and what thou seest write in a book and send it in the seven churches And we said to those churches, remember? But he said, I'm Alpha, I'm Omega, I'm the first and the last. And in verse 17, he says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as uh, as dead, and uh, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever." more. Amen. Actually, the scripture says that. Amen. (laughs) So be it. Truly, truly, it's a fact. And have the keys of hell and of death. There's the reality of this today. Unlike so many other false religions in this world, we have a Savior who is alive. We have a Savior who conquered death. So what am I worried if somebody's going to put me to death because I'm displaying Him? Hey, if my Savior conquered death, I think He can handle it when I die. If my Savior conquered death, I think He's got my eternity signed, sealed, and delivered, and I can display a Savior today who lives forever. And one day, I'll get to see Him face to face. Folks, can we be a church that displays the Savior. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.